Okay, I'm a little confused because I don't know what the hell George is doing doing a 3% withdrawal rate because that's absolutely wrong. The problem is, is when you go down these stupid nerd rabbit holes in these Reddit threads with these morons who live in their mother's basement with a calculator, <laughs> I'm perfectly comfortable drawing eight. But if you want to be a little bit conservative, seven, but sure not five or three funds. And the S&P is average 11.8. And if inflation for the last 80 years has averaged 4%, if you make 12 and you need to leave 4% in there for inflation raises, that leaves you eight. When Dave says things like you're getting 11 or 12% every single year, that is just false. You can't just assume you're gonna get 12% every single year the way Dave describes. Like you have to understand that one out of four years, you will lose money. Everything Dave just said does not hold up in an environment like that. Based on the chart I just showed you, that's 100% false. And I've studied under you know, the smartest minds in retirement income. These are all the goobers he's talking about that live in their basements. These people are actually some of the most accomplished people you could ever possibly meet. Hey, welcome back to another really, really exciting episode of The Better Wealth Show. I'm here with my good friend, Tom Wall, PhD in retirement income. Very smart. We, we're going we're gonna to talk about a lot of fun things today. I reached out to Tom because I've been seeing some videos float around about Dave Ramsey and it all made sense, Tom. It all made sense. Dave Ramsey, the way he believe, what he believes all makes sense to me. He said on public air that you should easily be able to get an 8% withdrawal rate in retirement. And he like talked down. I mean, some of the things that I'm going to share with you in this clip, it was like very strong language. And it all made sense to me because with that, with his philosophy, um, I have a lot more empathy. But then I started to ask myself this question, if he's wrong, could all the things that Dave Ramsey says, especially when it comes to mutual funds and rate of return and retirement, could it all be predicated on information that's just not correct? And so I thought bringing on someone that's done their own research, that's written a book on retirement income, who speaks to financial professionals all around the country and world on this subject, I, I can't think of a better person that I could react to this content with. And then I also know that you've done your own research and you will share with us um, some research and we'll let the audience decide who they think is more credible or what questions they have. So before we jump in, is there anything that you want to say? And I know that you haven't seen this whole clip, but you're aware of some of the things that Dave Ramsey says about income and distribution. Yeah, I'm very aware of what, what's been put out there lately. And I've actually seen some of the reactions from some of the top academics in this space. And, you know, the, I think my, my take on it is just, it's kind of irresponsible. You know, I think, there's a lot of financial advisors that I work with that get up in arms about some of the some of the recommendations that Dave or really anybody out there, some of these pundits make. And what I always tell them is, look, if you have an audience of millions or tens of millions of people, then oftentimes your advice has to be blanket statements, rules of thumb, stuff that you know really is targeted toward the average caller. <laughs> and sometimes if you listen to those calls, these people are in in dire straits financially, or they have you know strange situations that they're dealing with. So one size fits all financial advice is to, it just makes no sense to me. There's a lot of good that Dave and, and people like him do. Uh, there's tons of good that's done there, but sometimes when you get into the realm of you know complicated distribution planning, um, rules of thumb don't apply really. So I think it'll, it'll be interesting to go through this clip and talk through some of the finer points, and, and I, I think I'll have some some insights for you. Cool. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here's Dave Ramsey. So my question today is I'm baby step four, five, and six. I have about 120000 saved for retirement. That's across my IRA, my Roth IRA, my wife's Roth IRA, and the 401k. How old are you? And I'm uh, 30 years old. Good for you. Well done. Thank you. I feel from what I've been running the numbers with that I'm on the teetering edge of coasting financial independence. And I'm trying to best understand my plan with the end in mind. So how I'm going to turn that nest egg when I retire into income. I found on your website uh, a little article that talks about a uh, four to five percent withdrawal rate. And I was trying to run the numbers around that. And I thought I was close. And then about a what was it a month ago, George Camel released a video that said that the withdrawal rate for a 30-year time horizon should be closer to 3%. So if, if I can establish financial independence comfortably, then I was wondering if I could ease up on baby step four to pay off the house faster. 
I wonder if George is just watching this live being like, oh boy, I'm, I'm about to get my butt kicked. Okay, I'm a little confused because I don't know what the hell George is doing doing a 3% withdrawal rate because that's absolutely wrong. I don't, I'm going to have to find out where that video is and get it taken down because um, that's just wrong. You don't need to have a 3% withdrawal rate. That's ridiculous. Um, or I hope you misunderstood. I hope we didn't put out trash like that. Was maybe, it 4 to 5%? Like maybe, the, No, it shouldn't be 4 to 5%. It ought to be more than that. I mean, if you're well, making uh, 12 in good mutual funds and the S&P is average 11.8, and if inflation for the last 80 years has averaged 4%, if you make 12 and you need to leave 4% in there for inflation raises, that leaves you 8 <laughs> So I'm perfectly comfortable drawing eight, but if you want to be a little bit conservative, seven, but sure not five or three. Well, I was trying to back check it because, you know, the three to five, I thought that was a big range. And a lot of the studies I found showed. Well, there's a lot of studies that are stupid things. in this space. So it's just wrong. So Listen, think- man, the math I just gave you is the math. If you're making mm-hmm. 12% and inflation is four, and you leave four in there, so your nest egg grows by four. It's simple. Eight is what's left over. So if you got a million dollars and you leave four percent in there, that's forty thousand bucks. Okay, so you now have a million forty. So the next year you get your you get a rate of return of twelve percent, eleven and a half percent on the million forty. Mm-hmm. And the next year it'll be you know a million ninety. 1.1, right? And because you're so your nest egg is growing by the rate of inflation, giving you a cost of living raise every year. So as long as you're doing that, you're fine. Uh, and, and so if you want to be a you, little bit conservative, maybe five percent. But say, there's all these goobers out there have always put this four percent crap in the market, and I'm just irate right now that we have joined the stupidity. Why is it that stupid though? Like, I it's just too wanna... low. This is his daughter, by the way, and she's kind of like yes. got herself in the middle of this thing. <laughs> low because it's not realistic you do not need to live on percent of your money for your nest egg to survive yeah even if you did a rate of and return set, of 10 percent or something yeah, and what it sets up is this guy now he, he doesn't he doesn't think he's got enough money and he's already got one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and he's 30 years old and he's on a plan he's on a plan to be very wealthy and he's worried he's going to have enough money or not yeah you know, because uh, because we people, stupid people, put out <laughs> low withdrawal rates. Like you, but listen, if you, rather, okay. if you if you think you can only pull off four percent off of investments making twelve, where the flip is the other eight percent going? Well, four percent of it went to inflation. That's where it went. The other four percent is just sitting there. So you are growing your investments instead of living off of them. I'm not destroying the nest egg. I'm not even touching the nest egg. I'm growing the nest egg by leaving 4% eight, in there. Yeah. Taking eight yeah. off of a 12 okay, so, growth so rate. So go a go 10% rate of return. Go a little bit more conservative with your rate of return. Go 10%. What would you do with 10%? Well, then four off of that. So six. Six, yeah. But I, why, we, why are you going to underinvest? Yeah. I mean, this year, the S&P to date was 10%. Is, is 10%. And we're not even at the end of the year yet. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and everybody's talking about how bad the economy is. So, you know, I, most years mine have done much better than 12. And so I'm, but wouldn't I, you, but if you can do your standard of living though, lower than what you need, like if you don't need, if you don't need it, that's fine. Yeah. Like I'm 62, I'm pulling or 63. I'm pulling nothing off of mine. Right. Cause I don't need it. I still work. I still have an income. Right. 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 I, I don't need any of it. So but, it's all just, sitting but there you growing. could do but 4%. The, the, the problem is, is when you go down these stupid nerd rabbit holes in these Reddit threads with these morons who live in their mother's basement with a calculator, <laughs> and then you, then you put that out into the dadgum community, and then people go, I don't have enough money. It's hopeless. I'll never be able to save enough to retire. A million dollars should create for you an $80,000 income, boys and girls. So you should perpetually, like if forever, you should be able to pull 80000 forever and never destroy it. Now that that and so when you tell people that a million dollars creates a forty thousand dollar income, you go, oh, I've got to have two million dollars, and I can't make that. Then the, this system yeah, doesn't yeah. work. So what you're doing with this bogus math is you're stealing people's hope. 
All right, we'll stop there. I, he goes on a while, but you get the point. Um, lots of things, lots of things for you to respond there. I want to get your initial thoughts to this clip. Well, that's just entertaining. Um, I don't even know where to begin with that. Well, let's just, uh, for listeners who, you know, may have not done all the studies on this stuff, let's talk about where this all comes from. First of all, yes, the arithmetic average over time for the S&P 500 or, or the stock market for the last hundred years has been about 12%. That's about what you've gotten if you just had 100% stock market investments. Uh, if you have any mix of anything else, like fixed income or bonds or <laughs> things like that, then your average return is significantly lower than 12% because you're doing that to, for diversification and, uh, and for volatility purposes. There's also a concept called the geometric average. Geometric average is, is basically your, your real average rate of return when you account for losses in the market, which you do get about once out of every four years in the market. So one out of every four years, you're going to lose money. So when Dave says things like you're getting 11 or 12% every single year, that is just false. And the truth is during the accumulation phase, it doesn't really matter losing money. You know, there's a, there's a concept called dollar cost averaging, where if you put in a thousand bucks a month or whatever your number is on a monthly basis into an investment, then the great news is when the market crashes, you're, you're buying more shares with the same dollar amount. You're automatically buying more low. And when the market's really high, you're automatically buying less high. So over time on the accumulation phase, you know, there's this buying the dip philosophy when the market goes down, you know, buy more. Um, that's been very prevalent to the last decade or so. That all pans out just fine. Um, so dollar cost averaging, you're buying more, you know, when the market's depressed. Here's the problem. When you get into retirement and you start selling investments on a systematic basis, whether it's annually or monthly or however, whatever you're doing, if you're doing it on the same day, just systematically, well, you're doing the opposite, reverse dollar cost average. It actually works against you. So when the market's down and you sell because you have to take income for yourself to live off of, you're automatically selling more shares at a depressed price to get the same income. Let me give you some math on it. Here's a really simple one. Let's say you have $100. That's your net worth. It's 100 bucks, And you lose 25%. So now you're at what? $75, right? So you lost 25%, you're now at 70. So what does it take for you to get back to 100 in terms of a return? Is it 25%? It's no. gotta be higher, yeah. You've only got 750, so you actually need a 33% return. You need a bigger return to catch up. So here's the cannibalistic effect of, of retirement income cycles is let's say, let's do that same math. Let's talk, let's talk about Dave's 8%. Let's say you got that 100 bucks and you lose 25% because the market does go down once out of every four years, even though you don't wanna believe it. You get to 750 and then you take your 8% income. Okay. So now you're at a 33% loss. The account doesn't care whether the market took the money or you took it out to, to go buy whatever you're going to buy. Your account lost value. So now you're at a 33% loss or 660 or, or 66 bucks. What do you need to gain that next year to catch up to where you were supposed to be to get just to get back to even? It's 50%. You need a 50% gain to catch back up. And then according to Dave's math, since you're just going to keep generating wealth, you're going to average 12 and only take eight. You really need to be even further than that, getting a 60 to 70% gain to catch up. So this is the problem with sequence of returns risk is when you, when you retire into a period where the market goes down, which it does once out of every four years. And by the way, it wasn't that long ago. If you remember back in the early 2000s, from 2000, to, from 2000 to 2002, for three years in a row, you lost money in the market. And then just uh, six years later in 2008, you lost one of the biggest losses ever in stock market history. It was the lost decade of investing. Everything Dave just said does not hold up in an environment like that. And here's the thing. I'm also not a big fan of 4% rules or 3% rules. Where that comes from is actually not a suggestion of what on average you should be doing in retirement it's it's if you look at history over the last hundred years the worst case scenario retiring in 1966 in a period of massive inflation and a market that was not going up it was a stagnant economy and actually there was a big market crash in the early 1970s if you had retired in that year you could have started with a four percent withdrawal rate and still had money left over at the end of the, at the end of the 30th year um, in all other scenarios and other markets, you could have taken five, five or six percent. But the four percent rule came from that historical analysis of what's the worst case scenario in the market. And I don't know the research that was being cited, but 
some there are some people out there that are saying because we're in an all-time low interest rate environment and because equities are relatively highly valued historically speaking that it may be lower like three percent uh, and that's where three percent rules and four percent rules come from but the bottom line is there's no such thing as a rule you know history does not necessarily indicate what's going to happen in the future so four percent rules are just kind of a it was the worst case scenario there's nothing saying that it, it will be the worst case scenario we may have worse scenarios coming up when great depression part happens or a nuclear bomb goes off somewhere across the world and the whole world is in chaos we have no idea yeah um so in a nutshell you know i think he's completely ignoring the sequence of returns risk uh which is where and i've studied under you know the smartest minds in retirement income i mean we're talking about um, you know, Princeton PhDs and some of the most prolific authors in the space. These are all the goobers he's talking about that live in their basements. These people are actually some of the most accomplished people you could ever possibly meet, you know, prolific authors and um, multi-million dollar, you know, businesses they've built off of this, uh, helping millions of people. You know, that analysis is really about the volatility in retirement. And I have found, um, you know, the answer to a retirement income puzzle is not about, the gyrations in the market and guessing at what that re rate is that you should take out but it's actually about shifting you know some of your assets toward guaranteed programs and things that actually you know where insurance companies you know through annuities life insurance things like that will actually guarantee certain outcomes for you uh, versus just having this big bucket of volatile investments so that's a long way I... to Response. Yeah, I have so many, so many questions for you. First question is, w can you talk to me about what it looks like to get your PhD in retirement income and some of the studies that you did? And like, what was your thesis on? I'm just really curious about your process of like what things you've learned. And then my second question will be around your thoughts. You said a some things about the 3%, 4% rule. I'm curious if you didn't have these other insurance products that you talked about, if you just had money in mutual funds in your opinion, not knowing the future, what would, with the studies that you've done, what would you say if you had to like give blanket general education entertainment advice, what would you say that number would be? So question number one is talk to me about the goober way of learning your, uh, learning being a PhD in this space. And then number two, what would you say big picture if someone didn't have do any planning, but just had their money in the market, what they should be thinking about a safe withdrawal rate? Yeah, can I can I share something from some of my research? I think that would set the that would really yeah, set absolutely. the stage, create yep. some contact. Um, you can do whatever you want. It's an honor to have you on. <laughs> let me let me pull this up. So, what I'm showing you here is actually um, where the four percent rule came from. It's hard to believe, but it was actually uh, uh, thirty years ago in 1994. William Benjamin was a financial advisor at the time. He did a study around uh, safe withdrawal rates, historically speaking. And where it came from is, you know, in the 80s and 90s, retirement income planning was super simple because you could get so much money off of a CD that the, the thought process was just invest your money in CDs, never touch the principal or like live off the interest. And then when the CD was over at the bank, you just roll it into the next CD. And when you're getting, you know, upper single digits, or even, you know, if you go back far enough, even double digit returns uh, in terms of interest off those CDs, that worked out very well. But in the 90s, as interest rates really started to fall, uh, this advisor said, well, you know, that's that may not be feasible. Maybe it's okay if we actually take money all out of a volatile investment portfolio. And his numbers were slightly different than mine. He used a 50-50, you know, portfolio of stocks and bonds, and he didn't he didn't actually make any assumption for investment fees, which is just part of our reality. But my numbers are 60 40 with some very modest investment fees and what you can see here is basically at each given year all the way back to 1926 when my data set started what was the highest initial withdrawal rate that you could take so for instance in 1926 it was seven percent you could start with a million dollars take seventy thousand dollars in that first year increase it each year with by actual inflation not some assumed rate like dave threw out four percent not some assumed rate but actual inflation um, what was the highest rate you could start with such that you spent your last dollar on the last day over that 30 year period of time? And you can see that just a couple of years later, it was as low as four and a half percent. And then it was back up into the sevens and it, it, year by year, it dances all over the place. And really the two determinants of what that safe withdrawal rate is, is a, what is inflation? If, if we're assuming we need to inflate our income each year, which by the way, is also a big assumption for, for, for a lot of folks. Um, and B, what did the market do? 
So where the 4% rule came was right here in 1966. Like I said, his numbers were a little different with the 50-50 portfolio. You can see three and a half on my numbers, but um, basically in that year, you could have only spent th three and a half to start to then inflate it and see what, what, the, what the market did. But then just, you know, not even a generation later, 16 years later, you could have taken as high as 10% as a safe withdrawal rate. Uh, the problem is anyone retiring today or in the future, you have no idea which person you are on that chart. You have no idea which, which eventuality is going to be yours. On average, you know, a 6% withdrawal rate is actually historically sound. Um, in most cases, that actually, you know, would have worked out for, for folks, or maybe on average, it would have worked out for folks. But since if you all you have is this volatile bucket of investments, you really have no choice but to live to this worst case scenario, right? That's really all you can do is live to that worst case scenario, because what if you are that person? You know, what if you are the what if you are retiring into that worst case scenario with high inflation and a choppy market? And, you know, the 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 result of overspending is is an unacceptable, catastrophic failure, meaning you ran out of money in your advanced years in your 80s or 90s. Now what? You know, even if you could go back to work, you may not be healthy enough to do so. You've been out of the workforce for decades, like no one's going to hire you. Um, and is that really an eventuality you want to even entertain? Not to mention the fact that you've disinherited your family. You've, you know, you have obligations to a spouse, most likely that, you know, you're not living up to. So it's it's basically all the rules that go into accumulating wealth are fantastic. You know, there's there's a number of things we do. There's asset allocation. There's dollar cost averaging. There's rebalancing. Um, all of these things are essentially meant to and diversification, of course, they're all meant to manage the downside risk so that you can stay invested in and ride that volatile market upward. But once you get to retirement, when you're not adding to that anymore, um, sequence of returns risk comes in. If you and if you retire into a bear market and then you make that loss even worse by taking money out of that portfolio, it creates a scenario that you simply can't bounce back from. So. Um, you know, this this assumption of static 12 percent returns. And if you take eight, you're going to be in the positive um, is just wildly irresponsible because, you know, in a down year, if you take that same eight percent, your loss just got worse uh, than it would have been on average. And that's really where it all comes from. Uh, so that's that's some historical context on, on where that came from. And there's been countless studies by those goobers since then that have really dug into uh, <laughs> a little deeper into into that data and different portfolios and you know, blending in annuities and life insurance and all the different ways you can you can um, mitigate that. But in a nutshell, that's kind of where it all comes from. So if you if you didn't have if if you didn't obviously have context of someone's portfolio, but they had a 60 40 deal and you had to make a blanket statement, would you say three and a half percent because you just don't know what the future holds? Or what would you say if you were not in Dave Ramsey's point of view, but like if you had to make a blanket statement, and by the way, no one, this is not financial advice, retirement advice, distribution advice, this is entertainment purposes only. I just want to hear your thoughts, but then I would love to shift in like knowing what we know, what are things that we can do that can create confidence to increase more than three and 4%? Because I think we can all agree with Dave that three or 4%, if that's your outcome, is pretty sad. And with proper planning, that number can be bumped up. And yeah. that should be the goal, but his way of approaching it seems so irresponsible of just like, just, I can't, it's like, I, I hope people can see through that, but, but I understand why he gets so upset about the three or 4%, because if people actually understood that it would be way more depressing doing his seven steps. Yeah, well, this is, this is where the value of the, of a financial advisor is really, you know, understands retirement income planning comes into play. And frankly, it's a new practice, you know, in, in our space, you know, find, accumulating wealth actually isn't all that hard. You don't really need a financial advisor to do it. You can, you can kind of do it yourself as long as you're saving enough money and, and following some of the general principles of investing, but it's very much an art drawing the money out of these accounts on a safe basis. So my, my short answer to you is generally speaking, um, the less you have in guaranteed income sources, like if you don't have a pension or your social security income is going to be minimal, um, and to the extent that you are on the lower end of the income scale, so if you're retiring on like five figures of, of income, you know, versus a six figure, you know, mass affluent, then actually you probably have to focus more and more on a three to 4% withdrawal rate. And the reason for that is twofold. One is, um, A, inflation matters for you, 
All right. A lot of your expenses are non-discretionary, meaning food, housing, transportation, all, all the things we complain about in an inflationary environment, those matter a lot for you if you're going to retire on, on something lower, like a five-figure income in retirement. If you're going to retire with a six-figure or multi-six-figure income, then you're the kind of person where a lot more of your expenses are discretionary. So we're talking about, you know, golf club memberships or, you know, vacations around the world or taking grandkids on vacation or driving the nicer car than you need to. All that stuff. Those are things you could pull back on if you needed to. So you could absolutely take six to eight percent as a withdrawal rate, as long as you understand if those worst case scenarios happen like 1966 or if we enter a period of time like that. Well, then you might need to treat a year or two like the pandemic and you kind of stay home a little bit. You yeah. might need to do that. The mass affluent crowd, the, the wealthier crowd can do that. But for folks that are on the lower income scale, they can't. They have no choice. The bills have to get paid. They have to eat. So that's a big one. That's a big one is do we need inflation adjusted income or do we not? And study after study after study has shown that for folks that are in the higher income scales, their spending in retirement actually goes down on a yearly basis. So typically in your 60s and 70s, when you're healthiest and you're most able to do all the things I just said, um, you know, you, you're going to want to spend that money. You're going to want to pull that consumption forward into your retirement. As you get older, you know, you've kind of been there, done that. You may not be physically capable of, you know, golfing three times a week or whatever. So you kind of scale back and some of those expenses go away. Um, so that's my first that's my first part of the answer. Um, or in, 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 the way I kind of put it is in a nutshell is. If all you have is investments, whether that's 1 million or 5 million, whatever that number is, you will be afraid to spend because you're afraid of all of those eventualities that could happen. What if you live a very long time? What if there is a major healthcare shock? What if the next Great Depression does break out? What if hyperinflation takes over? And essentially what you're doing in that scenario, if all you have is investments and you have no guarantees, then the only prudent choice really is to live to that three to 4% withdrawal rate, because you have to act like your own insurance company. Yeah. You have to hoard all this wealth to basically pay for those potential eventualities. Think of it this way. If you buy a car, are you going to have a hundred thousand dollars sitting in a savings account just in case you crash into something? How inefficient would that planning be? Even if you could do it, um, not a single person on the planet would recommend that as a strategy, but that's what you're doing in retirement. If you're hoarding all this wealth and underspending. Um, so on the other hand, you know, I've, I actually have recommended to some clients to spend six to eight percent as a withdrawal rate in retirement, but it was only because they had big life insurance policies in place that were guaranteeing the legacy to their kids that they said they wanted to leave. It was guaranteeing the legacy to their spouse that at the very least they're obligated to leave to their spouse to make sure that they're not impoverishing their spouse upon death. Um, they also had access to cash values or other vehicles, you know, some through home equity or whole life cash values or things like that that they could tap into as that source of capital just in case so that they could spend more aggressively from from their retirement account or in some cases even annuitize you know most of the public doesn't really know that word but annuitize means you know turn your savings into a pension you know dave said you you know you can take eight eight percent off of your investment portfolio and have it last forever that's based on the chart i just showed you that's 100 percent false like there's no way there is a way if you're lucky if you retire in the right you know that it, it could work uh, but actually, historically speaking, you know, it, it's very infrequent that it has worked or, you know, through an annuity, you could actually buy, you know, a, an insurance contract from a company. It's like the opposite of life insurance. Instead of you paying a small premium and getting a big lump sum upon your death, you give them a lump sum and they'll then pay you an income for as long as you live, even if that's a long time. And right now, that's actually, you know, the cash flow rate on that is about seven and a half percent. So you could turn that million dollars into about seventy five thousand dollars of income you can't outlive. Um, but you can you, you can really only do that if you have, you know, permanent death benefits through life insurance that guarantee those legacies to the next generation. Because it would be irresponsible to annuitize all your money, not not knowing how long you're going to live. And number two, you you're you're not able to pass on anything. But what you're saying is, if you have a permanent death benefit that ultimately will pass on or transfer upon your death, you could then maximize your assets while you're alive, knowing that you can have your cake and eat it too. Exactly. Yeah. The, exactly. Can you, can you share your, your way of explaining volatility buffer? The, the way that I explain volatility buffer is we know the sequence risk loss of like, and we don't know when, but you said every four years, the market is, is going to dip is what volatility buffer in my 
the way I explain it is just not tapping into the market or your account when it's down and letting it recover and tapping it into an alternative asset class that that essentially you you're not spending reverse dollar cost averaging you're letting it rebound and yeah. as a result even if you didn't do the annuities if you just had a volatility buffer and your uh, retirement account like that alone would allow you to be able to potentially take out more knowing that you don't have to spend when the accounts are down and i even think about as a business owner i have a volatility buffer in business it, i'm able to take on additional risk and weather storms in business because I have access to capital. So I take this principle and use it while, while I'm in business, but the same principle can be true in, in retirement. Yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, the concept of volatility buffer basically says that, you know, it's okay to be invested in retirement. You know, your risk tolerance is what it is. So some people it's gonna be more heavily into equities and, and you know, volatile investments than others. But the concept of volatility buffer kind of goes back to where we started is if you have that hundred dollars and then you lose 25 percent you have to earn 33 percent to catch up right so that's fine historically speaking the market has been up more often than down so over time that's actually been okay um the problem lies is if you're down 25 percent and then you take money you're actually making that loss even more you know in the in the eyes of your account if you think of it that way so the volatility buffer concept basically says we want to have some of our capital somewhere else. And that's, you know, oftentimes what's untapped is home equity. A lot of people have a ton of home equity they can tap into through reverse mortgages, which used to be a dirty word, but it's not anymore. It's actually a really good strategy to use. That can be actual cash. It can be gold bars buried in your backyard. It can be a loan from rich uncle Steve, whatever it is. The money's coming from somewhere else outside your portfolio so that you can leave your portfolio and not forced, be forced to sell low and lock in those losses. So, you know, I, I actually did some historical studies on this and what is the value of having a year that you can take off. So in those 30 year return patterns we just went through, if, you know, if year three comes and that's a down market and you're losing money, uh, if you had money from just one year, if you just had one one year of income, you could pull from somewhere else. Any of those sources we just talked about, um, what would that do to the safe withdrawal rate on the on that portfolio? And what it came out to be was about 10 um, percent more income. So if your safe withdrawal rate, for instance, is 5%, if you're comfortable taking 5% out of that account, um, and then you were able to take money from somewhere else in one year following a down market and let your portfolio recover, then your safe withdrawal rate actually goes up to about five and a half hmm. off that portfolio. So even though it's a, a slightly smaller portfolio because you put some of that money somewhere else, um, it creates a lot more safety and there's, there's basically an outsize you know, gain that you get by uh, by having that strategy. And it's not new. It's, it's been around for decades and decades and decades. The investment world has used this for a very long time. Um, but, you know, in guaranteed products and insurance based products tend to be the most tax advantage, advantaged and accessible and, and probably the highest return over time, which is why a lot of our clients um, that we talk to kind of gravitate toward that. I love it, man. I love it. And is there anything else in, in right now going on that is, interesting to you or anything that else that you'd find that you would want to share just with our audience i there we're, we're trying to sound the alarm more about future stuff because a lot of our a lot of the people that watch this channel are you know making money they're in business they're investing they don't really care about retirement but for me i just think of retirement as future cash flow and give yourself more options and we should care about what the future holds because we can determine what we do in the present yeah, I mean, I think the concept of retirement is changing. It used to be that you went to go work for somebody else and you basically, you, you shaved off a, a portion of your current income so that over time you could replace your human capital, the value of you and all your working years moving forward and replace it at some point with financial capital. And there comes this tipping point at retirement, whether that's 60, 65, whatever it is, where there's enough money, enough actual uh, dollars earning interest that will generate more value than you can as a human, right? That's a, it basically replaces your value. That's, that's kind of the whole idea is human capital gets replaced with financial capital. Uh, that paradigm is changing quite a bit these days, especially in the business owner community. I think if you have income producing properties like real estate, or if you have an income producing business, or in today's remote world, even if you can do fractional work, if you can work part-time, sometimes that's a better lifestyle than just turning it off and sitting around all day. I think people are redefining what financial independence means to them. Uh, you know, for me, financial independence means just being able to 
work on my terms, but I can't imagine ever not, you know, contributing to society and working and, and you know, bettering myself that way. So I think that's one of the shifts. Uh, but there's definitely a shift toward what we talked about today. Um, you know, it used to be, and we're going way back here, but you know, if you go 50 years ago, you worked for a big corporation your entire life and you had a pension and then there was some social security and then you died in your seventies. Well, now people are living a long time and all of those, or not all of them, but a lot of those pensions, you know, when the private employers have moved toward, you know, defined contribution plans, even if you're in business for yourself, it's kind of on you to save that money in, in some kind of qualified plan. So you're, we're left with this dilemma of getting to retirement and having this big pool of investments, but then not knowing how to spend it. And I can tell you from all my work with thousands of advisors over the course of my career, there's still only a tiny fraction of financial advisors that are true financial planners that talk about retirement income planning. The vast majority of them are just asset gatherers. They're happy to gather your assets, roll your money into an account, and they do good work. They'll help you, you know, invest properly and accumulate wealth. But they typically stop there in terms of their discussions of, of how it comes out. And without a strategy for how it comes out, um, you can't just do that at 70 years old. You can't just then yeah. then deploy a strategy. To the extent you can do that in your 40s and 50s or even earlier, you're going to have a lot more flexibility to spend later on. And I think that's the cutting edge planning. I think everyone's in a different scenario based on their risk tolerance, their goals, their area of life but is there a certain type of portfolio when it comes to equities life insurance and annuities that you like or it would be like a starting place and then you adjust or is everyone so different i think everyone's so different but if you talk about that volatility buffer concept you know what i want to do you know for my portfolio so i'm not i'm not going to give advice to other people but for me i want to know that whatever investments I'm able to accumulate when I get to retirement, I want to have about 20% of that in permanent whole life insurance cash value from a mutual dividend paying company. Um, and why I want that is because A, it's guaranteed to go up in value. The only question is how fast. That's how whole life insurance works. Um, I'm participating in the profitability of the company. I've guaranteed a death benefit. So I know that legacies are being paid to my, uh, to my kids. Um, and my spouse, I'm going to have access to long-term care benefits through through that contract because a lot of these contracts can be built with that. And what that does in my portfolio, when I said when I said 20% of my overall invested net worth and whole life cash value is, I know that's at least three to four years of a buffer asset, basically three to four years that I can pull from from an asset that I know is going up in value, so I can let my other investments, you know, regardless of how risk tolerant I am at that time, I can let those investments do what they do. I'll tell you a story. I got a call from from a, a former client of mine. I've been out of the I've been out of the business myself in terms of um, working with clients for for quite quite a few years. But one of the first ones I sold um, was a retiree. I want to say he was you know he's in, around seventy years old. You know, not fabulously wealthy, but I think it's worth a few million bucks. Has done well. And we were talking and he said, hey, by the way, you know, I just want to let you know, I took a $75,000 loan out of that life insurance policy you sold me all those years ago. And I'm just thinking, you know, that's great. But but why did you do that? You know, why did you do that? You're, you know, you're worth plenty, plenty of money. You're, you live pretty frugally. You know, you probably didn't need to do that. Why did, why did you take the money out of the policy? And with no coaching, he did this on his own. And he said, well, this was 2022. He's like, I'm looking around me and, and just everything's down. My, my stocks are down, my bonds are down, some of my, you know, my funny, fun money investments, they're all down. I don't really want to sell them low. So I just, you know, I took a loan from the policy and it was tax free and it was there, you know, within a week. And, um, and that would just help me meet my income for the next six months and, and, I'll, and I'll see what happens. And what happened was everything came roaring right back. And that's the value of it. It was just such a fun story because um, he just kind of saw it himself. He's like, this is the asset that's up. So I'm just going to touch that asset. So having an asset that always goes up and has those guarantees in place, that's really your permission to you know, spend and stay invested in, in retirement. Whereas if you don't have those assets, you, you really have no choice but to live to these three and 4% rules, which by the way, are, are, are not stupid stuff that goobers are making up. It's, it's the reality if you've done no other planning. That, that actually is what a prudent person should do if they've done no other planning. Yeah. The a lot of people talk about diversification, but they mm -hmm. they stop at just diversifying the same asset class. I think what's beautiful is if you diversify in different asset classes that aren't correlated, you could have a horrible year in the market, but there's a, actually other assets that you could have in your portfolio that aren't affected by that. 
and that again, there, what is the value of, of having options? Uh, great. And I think, I think our generation gets that because we, we value freedom, we value optionality. Whereas I think, you know, there's certain other generations that that may have not been like a part of their life from the very beginning. And so I do think things are going to change as it relates to people's expectations and mindset when it comes to retirement. Yeah. And I think that at the end of the day, like I am a believer in the market. I am a believer in equity, equity investments. I'm actually a biggest believer in if you have your own business and your own human capital, invest in that. But if history is a guide, you know, history is no indication of future results. But if the market does moving forward return better than, you know, positive results three out of four years, you should be heavily invested in those years. Yeah. But you can't just assume you're going to get 12% every single year the way Dave describes. Like you have to understand that one out of four years, you will lose money. Yeah. Therefore, you do need a portion of your portfolio that you can touch in those years that will happen. This is not an if, it will happen yeah. so that you can stay invested with the rest. Without it, you're going to be forced to sell low and that and it starts the cannibalistic effect where your, your portfolio yeah. will implode upon itself. Um, last question for you on my end. I, I know that you've mentioned 20% in whole life. I know that there's a lot of people out there that probably use my book, use your book, use our videos and promote index universal life. What is your two cents on IULs index universal life? What do you like about it? And what, what do you may not like about it? Cause I know that you're intentional about saying whole life and not just life insurance. Yeah, I'm I'm a whole life guy. And the reason I'm a whole life guy is not that's not bias, it's research. Index universal life is often sold, you know, because it has upside potential and downside protection. Basically, in, in a nutshell, what they'll do is they'll say, we'll guarantee you that your crediting rate on a year to year basis is is never lower than zero percent, which sounds really good. And the catch for that is that there's going to be some cap on the upside, um, like 10 percent is, is kind of a going rate these days. So on average, if you kind of run that through a historical model, you've averaged six to 7% over time. And that's oftentimes how it's sold. Universal life has, is a more flexible premium structure. You can kind of fund it however you want, whenever you want. As long as enough money is going in there to pay those mortality charges of a life insurance contract, you can fund it however you want and have really great tax advantages. So it's very attractive for some folks. But the problem with universal life, particularly IUL, is that <clears throat> over time, you are absolutely capped on what you can earn. Uh, it's a little more complicated than our conversation needs to be today, but the way they actually price these products is it's an option strategy. The company doesn't actually take any risk on their own. They're buying like a call option spread that says, you know, we're going to capture the returns between zero and 10%. That call option spread is based on the, uh, it's called an options budget, which comes from what they're earning in their general investment account. So obviously it's a, it's a little, little complicated in terms of how they do that, but it's derived from what they're earning in their general investment account. With whole life insurance, you know, they also have general investment accounts that are paid out through policy under dividends. So because of that, because those options are priced on uh, basically the same number, over time, your best case scenario, if you believe in efficient markets, uh, and you should because there's algorithms scouring right the, mm -hmm. the web every single day looking for opportunities to invest and find arbitrage, then your best case scenario in an IUL over time is what you're probably going to get in whole life anyway, right? As because the general investment account earnings are, are picking a dividend at the same rate that they're creating options budgets. But an IUL guarantees you nothing in the long run. They'll guarantee you in one year that you're not going to have a 30% loss. But if you underperform at any time, those mortality charges, you know, kind of take over, whereas whole life is guaranteed to work. The only question is, does it work this well or does it work this well? But it will work and it will actually grow and you, you will have cash eyes equal your death benefit someday. So I focus on whole life because of the guarantees, because you can get bond like returns over time. But the company has soaked up all the guarantees and shifted that to them kind of yeah. in the insurance example I said before, whereas an IUL, it could work. Um, yeah. But it, but the consumer bears all of the risk. And if it ever underperforms, you know, it's going to be asking for more contributions to make it whole, whereas um, you don't see that in other flavors. And not, not to put words in your mouth, but life insurance is not an investment. And so if, you, if you're talking about safe, non-correlated money, you just like, why take additional risk? Like no one would argue that whole life has a lot more guarantees built up than, than index universal life. And some, some people would say that as a bad thing because you have upside better upside in index universal life but the point that you're also making is if you want upside 
and you have a proper volatility buffer, why don't you just put the money in the market? Not investment advice, but over time, like you'll probably earn a greater return than trying to trying to have best of both worlds in a in an IUL. Yeah, well, there's two there's two things that permanent life insurance, you know, cash value or that whole life insurance particularly helps you mitigate, and it's risk and taxes. So from a tax standpoint, you know, if you think about a variable universal life or even an IUL, you know, where you're investing in basically an option strategy, you know, you can make those same investments on your own without life insurance even being involved. All life insurance does is give you a nice tax wrapper around it. And the same thing with whole life, you know, the underlying investments of the general investment account, if you're wealthy enough and smart enough, you could kind of build that same portfolio uh, that kicks off those dividends and get similar returns over time and put a nice tax wrapper around it. The difference with whole life is there's actual guarantees. So not only are you going to get bond like returns over time, but you're also guaranteed that your money is going to grow, not just zero, but it's actually going to grow. So what it does is it gives you a better risk adjusted return for the smart folks listening. It's the sharp ratio. That's what they're chasing on Wall Street is how do we get better risk adjusted returns for the same level of risk outsized returns? You're typically not going to get that with whole life or for the same level of returns, bond like returns, how do we minimize the risk? And you do that through the life insurance contract and the company taking that risk off the table. So that's why I focus on whole life versus these other flavors of life insurance, which do have the same great tax treatment, but they haven't taken, but none of the risk has been shifted. So they're basically just the same thing you can do elsewhere. Um, so optimize that safe stuff. And that gives you permission to then, you know, take advantage of investment opportunities at low cost elsewhere more efficiently. Permission to spend. You were almost going to say it. Um, Tom, thank you. Thank you. It is an, always an honor to have you on the show. We will have your any any links that you want us to promote down below. I will say if you are a financial professional, if you are into life insurance and you want to join a mastermind, that will be like the best bang for your buck, not investment advice. Um, check out what Tom's doing. I have had the pleasure of being involved and I love, I love what you're doing and I'm excited to see where you're growing in the future and the community that you're building. And I would recommend anybody who wants to actually be more educated about this to get your book. And um, if, you, if you have a chance to get the book, make sure to review it on Amazon. That helps uh, authors get their, their content out. Is there anything else that you want to say before we wrap this up? No, I'd say that I, I serve I serve two folk, uh, two groups of people. So I work with financial advisors, you know, hundreds of them on a weekly basis through a group called Whole Life Masterminds. You can go to wholelifemasterminds.com to see how to how to get involved in that. And that's just to make advisors better at talking about all these concepts and and you know, positioning protection based vehicles in, in clients' retirement plans uh, and beyond. If you're a consumer, if you're not in the financial advisory space, I'd say go to permission to spend.com where you can, you know, you can, we'll send you a, a free, free copy of the book plus shipping, but also give you an opportunity to kind of get engaged and, and look at your plan and um, work with one of the advisors that I work with, um, you know, to help you help you move forward with some of these protection based strategies, which should, in my opinion, help you unlock the value of a lifetime of savings more efficiently than, than what Dave's thrown out there. I love it, man. Tom, thank you so much for being on the show. <laughs>